Welcome to Protocol Particulars, the video interview series where we meet with authors of ASAP CRM protocols to discuss their protocol and uh, the benefits of the protocol and also the um, critical steps that are associated with that protocol. For this episode, I have with me Jonathan Brider, who has a master's degree and is a graduate student uh, from the University of Cambridge. Jonathan is part of the Vendrascolo and Lee Labs and is also a member of Team Wood with ASAP. Um, hi, Jonathan. How are hi. you? Yeah, I'm good. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Good. So for today's episode, we are going to be focusing on your protocol called Free Floating Mouse Brain Immunohistochemistry. Before we go into that, though, I was wondering if you could just briefly tell us about your ASAP project and how the protocol relates to the project. Sure, yeah. Um, so in our ASAP project, um, we are focusing on uh, sort of a lot of microscopy techniques and, and sort of really cutting edge microscopy, um, trying to improve sensitivity and uh, detection thresh thresholds. And in that context, we're looking at um, detecting very early stage and um, very small oligomers of um, the pathological protein alpha-synuclein um, in human brain tissue samples. Um, and so for that, also, we apply different methods of immunohistochemistry um, with a specific focus on increasing our signal to noise ratio. Um, so really making sure that all of our work is very clean um, and that we're able to detect um, sort of diffraction limited smaller than 200 nanometers in size, um, uh, uh, well, oligomers or small aggregates of alpha-synuclein and sort of being able to better understand how they um, co-localize in different uh, regions of the brain as disease progresses um, and how they might actually be involved in, well, um, uh, the disease progression or the disease onset itself and how that relates to larger pathologies, um, which are uh, sort of historically more commonly used as markers for disease like Lewy pathology. Um, so yeah, we're looking at really tiny things um, in human brain tissue, uh, these tiny alpha-synuclein aggregates, and for that, immunohistochemistry is a really great way of doing it. So this protocol is focused on staining under the free-floating conditions. And I was wondering in what context would someone want to do immunohistochemistry under free-floating versus the slide-mounted conditions? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. Um, I think sort of it was, I, maybe I should preempt everything by saying I don't think one is necessarily better than the other. Um, I think both have their individual use cases, and that was something that I had to learn when I first learned this protocol. I thought I'll just do it for everything, but um, uh, both of these techniques have their have their individual um, sort of yeah use cases, as I said. So I think for the for the free floating method, um, the the largest pros of using it um, that I see for me at least in my hands, the first thing is tissue penetrance. Um, so if you have a thicker tissue tissue section, anything that's sort of above twenty microns in thickness. Um, and you care a lot about, like we do, for example, about co-localization of small proteins um, with different cell types um, in the brain, um, especially in the 3D dimension, right? So the Z dimension, uh, it's good to cut thicker. And then um, you need your antibodies to penetrate all the way into the tissue. Um, so you get nice images uh, that are consistent on the borders of the tissue, but also on the inside. And for that, free floating is really, really good because um, the immersion in the reagent just uh, increases the tissue penetrance a lot compared to doing it on a slide um, where one side of it is, is always stuck to the slide and you get much poorer penetrance. Um, and so you can turn that right around and say, well, look, if I have a very thin tissue section, um, anything below yeah, 20 or 15 microns in size, um, actually what happens is the free floating is a bit rougher on the tissue, so to speak. Um, so what might happen if you have a very thin tissue section you're trying to stain um, and you're doing a free floating, it might happen that it dissociates or it comes apart a little bit or um, it starts becoming a bit fuzzy on the edges. Um, so that's one of the downsides. If you have a thinner tissue section, if you really care about specific protein-protein interactions, it's probably better to stain them on a slide. Um, I think that's sort of the first uh, uh, set of reasons for choosing one or the other. And then the other big thing about free floating is batch size. Um, so in a free floating mat uh, method, you can stain a lot of tissue sections at the same time very quickly and very, very cost efficiently. Also, if you think about costs like using antibodies, um, using, you know, fluorophores, all that kind of thing, all these reagents, um, you save a lot of, well, quantity by doing it in a free floating way because you can incubate them all in one container, let's say. 
Um, and secondly, you can just, you can basically stain a whole mouse brain, for example, in one go. Whereas if you were to do that on a, on a section, you might have three or four mounted per section before you start staining them. You would have, you know, hundreds of, of uh, microscope slides flying around. Um, so yeah, throughput, really, if you, if you care about high throughput, um, or if you care a lot about tissue penetrance, I think free floating is a really good um, uh, avenue to explore. Yeah. So you kind of touched a little bit on some of the logistical aspects, you know, when you mentioned that you can, you know, look at the whole brain or you can do the batches. So um, something else that I was thinking about is if you were to think back to when you first started actually conducting these types of experiments, what were the tricky parts in the process? So your protocol looks at like tissue collection, prep staining and imaging. And so if there were any parts in that whole process that were really tricky that you could give advice on to others who were starting this experiment, I think that would be great. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, uh, I'll try to give some insights there, obviously just with any uh, other protocol too, you have some some quirks you have to work out in the beginning, uh, stuff doesn't work or doesn't quite work the way you want it to. Um, but uh, sort of some insights that I think I gained from from learning this from a postdoc of mine back in the day and and developing it further. Um, the first thing I think is what I found the most important in making this whole protocol work consistently and very well is the washing steps. So because you have really good um, tissue penetrance of your antibodies and whatever you might be putting in, some dye, some small molecule, um, it's also really important that you wash your sections very well. So there's lots of washing steps in the protocol. You'll see that, uh, I think, for um, after the secondary antibody incubation, you'll have four times 10 minutes of washing um, multiple times. And that sounds like a lot. And it sounds like you can sort of cut those short or just do two or just do three. Um, but I found that, you know, doing the proper washing and giving it the time it needs actually greatly improves your, your signal. Uh, and it decreases your background. So it's just to really um, wash out those nonspecific interactions of the antibodies in your tissue that helps a lot um, with increasing the quality of your images ultimately. Um, and then the other thing I think uh, I already touched upon briefly is the making sure that the tissue sections stay intact. So um, as you do most of these things on a horizontal shaker um, and you might do them in different settings. So I, in my protocol, I write to use the, the net wall inserts. So they go into the uh, into the well plates like that, and you can shake them in there, but you can also do it equally in a, in a small glass vial. Um, so there's no sort of harsh points that the tissue could catch on. Um, but yeah, just moving it around constantly for hours on end or overnight um, can definitely mess with the tissue depending on how well it's been fixed and how long you've had it in storage. Um, so just being aware of that, maybe uh, you know moving down the, the shaking speed ever so slightly, um, but also looking at how they look when you start the staining and how they look when you finish the staining is good. Um, there for the the trickiest part in the beginning is I think um, uh, actually sort of a mechanical skill and that's transferring the tissue sections. So when you do it the way I suggest with the different well plates um, in order to, to conserve the quantity of antibody you use, when you do an antibody incubation, you do it in a 24 well plate. So those are much smaller uh, openings. So they hold less volume. And uh, in order to get them from the net wall inserts into those smaller openings, um, I use a very fine tipped, uh, uh, like a paintbrush. Uh, and that might sound a bit ridiculous and people in the lab always make fun of me for, you know, they go, oh, you're painting again, you know, you're an artist. Um, but I have very particular paintbrushes that I'm a big fan of. Um, you can get them in any hardware store, obviously, but um, it's good to have one that's very fine tipped. So it's not very broad and that has soft bristles. And then you always wash it out in filtered PBS or even in ethanol, obviously between steps um, and between using different antibodies. Um, but it helps because you can sort of scoop under the tissue tissue section. It lays flat on the on the paintbrush and you can just move it over and sort of uh, have it slide off of your paintbrush without damaging it at all. And that's sort of, at least for me, the, the easiest way and the best way I've found of transferring tissue sections back and forth. And equally, once you're finished with the whole staining, um, and you're mounting your sections on a on a microscope slide, um, the paintbrush comes in super handy again. You just take it out of solution, uh, wet the wet the um, microscope slide ever so slightly, and literally just scoop them on. You can use the paintbrush to make sure they're all flat and all aligned, um, and that really makes your life a lot easier. Um, one more thing I'll mention, I think this is true also for uh, on microscope slides when you're doing the on-slide staining, is I've always found consistently with lots of antibodies that I've used, primary antibodies that I've used, that an overnight incubation at four degrees um, works much better than 
an hour or two or three at room temperature. So I know people like to, you know, everyone's time is valuable. I have this problem too, that an overnight makes it a two day protocol instead of a one day protocol. Um, but it just, it just looks better in my hands. Um, so I would recommend if you try the one, two, three hour room temp and it doesn't look that great, or you're not sure your antibody's binding well, the overnight usually does it for me. So that's the other thing that um, I found to be super helpful actually, yeah. Awesome, yeah, that's really great insight. I love that you talked about the paintbrush and that's fantastic. Um, we've kind of touched a little bit on that the tissue is important, um, you know, as you mentioned, staying intact, as well as like the thickness for the free floating versus being on the slide. Um, and so that just kind of had me thinking about different types of tissue. So this protocol is specifically in the title mentions it's for mouse and it's for brain tissue. But I was wondering if you thought that this could be transferable to other types of tissues or if you'd even ever tried it. Yeah, I think that's a good question. I think well, to be honest, the reason I called it mouse brain immunohistochemistry is because that's all I do with the uh, with the protocol. But um, I, the previous work uh, that I did and the lab that I worked in, um, they did a lot of uh, sort of research on kidneys and livers as well of mice and um, uh, other sort of um, yeah small uh, garden door mice and, and animals that hibernate, let's say. Um, and there, uh, this the protocol worked equally well. So I've seen it uh, applied to kidney tissue and to liver tissue without problems. Um, I think in principle, it should work for almost all um, sort of fixed tissues that I can think of. I haven't ever tried it on um, frozen fixed tissue. Um, should also work, but I know that the tissue integrity can be a bigger problem there. Um, so those might be easier to do on a, on a microscope slide. Um, but overall, I've seen it, I've definitely seen it used in, in kidney and, uh, and liver tissue. Um, and I think also I've seen someone use it on human brain tissue. So again, it's, uh, you know, paraffin uh, embedded and fixed, but should should work equally well, in my opinion. Yeah. All right. So we've covered quite a bit and you said, you know, several things that I think users will want to know about this protocol. But I would definitely be remiss if I didn't ask you if there was just any last things that you wanted to share before we ended this. Um. Yeah, I think, I don't know, I think uh, in general, it's a it's a very, I hope that it's a very widely applicable um, sort of protocol that many people can use. As, as I said, it shouldn't be uh, limited to, to brain tissue. I think as long as your tissue is fixed and relatively strong, let's say, and thick enough uh, in cut, I think um, uh, you'd be fine using this protocol. Uh, the one thing that I will say is I think that, um, especially for the antibodies that you use, um, you know, the concentrations that I mentioned here are obviously very specific to the ones that I've used. And but in general, I found that you can even go a bit more dilute than what the manufacturers or the the um the suppliers recommend. Um so when you look at the IHC protocols, usually I find they um they make the recommendations based on um doing it chromogenically. And I think um for fluorescence microscopy, um at least in my hands, you can you can go a bit more dilute without a problem. Uh, the last thing I want to say, and this is again coming from someone who does uh, very, very sensitive microscopy, sort of looking at single molecules, hopefully, um, I think I say this in the protocol too, and I think it's a generally good practice when you're doing um, high resolution microscopy is to filter all your reagents. Um, so this is something that is in my protocol. Um, all my reagents that I ever, that ever come into contact with my tissue are filtered um, through uh, a filter that will uh, significantly decrease um, the amount of background fluorescence that you get out of your tissue. Uh, and it's generally good practice, especially when you use things for blocking like skim milk powder. I would not use this. It's fluorescent itself. Um, but also BSA, um, there's always a bunch of other proteins in there that are going to mess with your um, with your background. So filtering all your reagents is a really good um, general practice to do, I think. Um, yeah, I think that's kind of that's kind of what I wanted to say there. All right. Thank you so much, Jonathan. This is really helpful. Thank you very much.